So this is a, uh, a, potted his, uh, a potted talk of the highlights of a paper that should be out in a journal called Geoarchaeology later this year. And there's four authors on this. Ingrid Ward, who's sitting over there against the wall. And she's the archaeologist on the team. So if there's anything... <laughs> well, you're more of an archaeologist than I am. So if you've got <laughs> archaeological questions, please ask Ingrid. Um, uh, that's me. Um, it's in collaboration with Peter Ross, who's just recently finished his PhD at the University of Flinders and is probably out in the South Australia desert right now. And Chris Fandry, who's, um, uh, I was going to say even older than I am, but probably some of you are older than I am too. Um, Chris has been uh, a pioneer in um, modelling of oceanographic systems for about 50 years. He was head of CSI Marine in Hobart um, uh, in his past life. Right, so our title, Applying Sedimentological Principles to Coastal Archaeology. Um, it's a bit grand, but it's basically a sediment, oceanography sedimentology talk at the coast, applying it to testing something about some coastal archaeology. And we're testing something about some artifact scatters, which I'll show you in a moment. So we know where we are. We're 1,500 metres. Uh, 1,500 metres? This is... Have you, have you tried the ginger beer? It's really good. 1,500 kilometres north of Perth, up the Dampier Archipelago. Um, you're familiar with the Burrock Peninsula and the sort of um, uh, group of islands to its north with Nickel Bay on the eastern side, quite an open shallow bay, and a more complex array of islands on the west, Mermaid Sound and the port of Dampier, and thousands of um, huge um, bulk carriers going in and out of Mermaid Sound uh, over the year. Um, there's three places that I'm going to refer to in the talk. One is up here, this dot, um, which is between North Gidley Island, I'm quite impressed by how steady my hand is, <laughs> and the little island to the north. Um, and then we're going to look at Flying Foam Passage, um, an artifact in the bottom, which I might show you, but artifacts on the edge of Flying Foam Passage. So there's three sites that I'll talk about, two more than, two more than the other. Um, why are they important? Well, back in um, July 2020, the uh, Flinders University publication, uh, led by Jonathan Benjamin, um, was publicised very broadly around the world. Um, I don't know what language that is, somebody might, somebody might know that one. It was on SBS News, Bangkok, Forbes in the States, TVNZ, The Guardian, Business Insider, it was all over, it, was low. it made the news on the BBC, CBS and ABC in America. And it was all about having the first, for the first time, found Aboriginal artefacts on the seabed off Western Australia. Um, two underwater archaeological sites had been discovered off Western Australia's north for the first time. Interruptions are permitted. Sorry. Go on, Amy. At least 3,000 known prehistoric sites in the Northern Hemisphere. Yeah. Yeah. So, for those of you who didn't hear that, this is about 3,000 uh, documented marine archaeological sites around the world. Prehistoric. I don't know what that means. Um, is that before people could write? Um, in, the northern, in the Northern Hemisphere, but very few in the Southern Hemisphere and none around Australia yet. So this, this was a first and it was big, and if I was in the university, I'd publicise it too. But, um, so it was a bit of... Um, it was a big issue. Um, and so after a bit of convincing, um, Ingrid and I started to examine it a little bit and just test a few things about whether this was true. And this is where this talk uh, comes from. Uh, and this is a, um, the, the major site that I'm going to talk about, and that northern site of north of Gidley Island. This is looking west through um, a channel that goes round and into the other side there. And you can see a tidal sandbank on the on the right hand side and it's a quite a beautiful stark um, site as much of northern australia is these are the three papers concerned uh, b2020 which is by jonathan benjamin and a heap of other authors called aboriginal artifacts in the continental shelf blah 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 you can read 
second one I'm going to talk about is this one, which is on the flanks of flying foam passage. The third one is this one, which was that in the middle of flying foam passage. So that's just to prove that they're real papers. Now there are there was much associated publicity, and just for example, for this paper here, to date, and I look today, there are 20 citations of this work, 79 separate news articles uh, around the world, and numerous Twitter feeds and blog posts. Um, and uh, there is a problem because not any of the citations, nor the news articles, or the Twitter feeds or blog posts examine whether these claims are true or not. And I don't think that's very scientific. And I worry about uncritical repetition becoming fact. So let's test a few things. So the paper's claims were all accepted. And the claims are the fundamental claims. And there are many, but let's concentrate on the critical ones. These are some of the artifacts found on that northernmost site. Whoops, I'm pressing the wrong buttons. Sorry. At this site here at Cape Brugier. These are some of the artifacts found by Jonathan Benjamin and Co. in their paper. Beautiful photographs, lovely artifacts, 269 of which were claimed as underwater and in situ, of which 169, they said, are permanently submerged. Uh, and there's one artifact in, in the middle of flying foam passage by Chelsea Wiseman and Co. that was claimed as in situ and that's what the artifact looked like. Okay, so that's the claims of those two. The other paper, Joe Dorch's paper, D, these are some of the artifacts that he found on the flanks of Flying Foam Passage on the western side of Dolphin Island. Um, he found several hundred artifacts uh, on land, but several hundred on the intertidal zone, and they were claimed to be in situ. So just to remind you, we've got three sites up here. I'm going to call Cape Brugier. Oh, I keep pressing the wrong button. And then two in Flying Foam Passage, one in the base and one on the edge. So why am I here talking to you today about archaeology? Because um, geoarchaeology, it's all about studying the natural physical processes that affect archaeological sites, right? So it's, it's a thing called site formation. Archaeologists describe a site and how it's, how it's formed um, which, through geological processes. And of course, there are effects after accumulation of those artifacts too. So that's, in my book, that's basically sedimentology, right? Well, I think it is. So there's two critical questions we can ask of these papers. The first one is, are these artifacts actually underwater? I think permanently submerged must mean below lowest astronomical tide. Otherwise, it's not permanent. So we'll examine this. Secondly, are the artifacts in situ? In situ means in the place that they were deposited, right? I think there is a key question to be asked when you're, when you're told that something's in situ. And the key one is, can movement of those artifacts be ruled out? And I think by four separate things. First of all, can it be ruled out by modern hydrodynamic processes? Can it be ruled out by people, either modern or ancient? Can it be ruled out by processes in our part of the world during the Holocene high stand, which was higher sea levels than we have today? And can it be ruled out during the periods of shallow water inundation when the rising post-glacial sea level affected and first brought those artifacts under the sea. So there's four separate questions. There's probably some more, but I think those are the four fundamental ones. So we'll examine these as well. First, a bit of context. Um, uh, sorry, these are, this is very young, right, for most of you geologists. So, <laughs> so this is a sea level curve that only goes back 140,000 years, right? So this is not very old for you guys. This is the last interglacial, where the last time when the the ice caps were large, uh, were, were small. <laughs> it's a good cider. Uh, um, um, so the period much similar to today, and this is the sea level falling down, the last glacial maximum about 20,000 years or so ago, 
when sea levels in our region are at roughly 100, 110 meters lower than they are today. Then we had the post-glacial -sea, post sea level rise up to our period of interest. And the period of interest is here, the last eight or 9,000 years, which I'll make bigger because it's useful. So that's the dots on here are roughly um, uh, from cor dated corals and the blue line you can read represents the minimum age using oxygen isotopes, right? So broadly from that, we know that sea level rose roughly over the last nine or 10,000 years from 30 odd meters up to a peak and then it's relaxed in the last five or 6,000 years. So this is meters up the side, meters below present sea level, and that's just years going backwards in time. And just here, I've just put the ranges, vertical ranges of all the artifacts in the three papers concerned. So the B2021s operate, um, sit in this range, D19 here, and the single artifact in the base of flying foam passage sits at about 14 meters depth. So if that artifact was in 14 meters depth at the time that it was flooded, it would have been flooded by the rising sea level around nine-ish thousand years ago. And broadly, these would have begun to be flooded roughly nine, eight, seven thousand years ago. Okay? And we've had a, me uh, a high stand um, peaking at about six thousand years ago of about a meter and a half above modern sea level, as much as we can determine. Oh. There are other relevant water levels here. That's sea level, but there are other critical water levels. First of all, the tidal range. The tidal range in the Dampier Archipelago today is five meters. So minor, it goes down two and a half and up two and a half, in fact, slightly more. The other thing is that tropical cyclones, we know during the, from measurements, um, modern measurements that, that we've had tropical cyclones raise water levels in the Dampier Peninsula up to eight meters above where they should have been at the time. And we know from Holocene data going back six to 8,000 years that we've had tropical cyclones that have reached 12 meters above. They brought the sea level up by 12 meters more than the sea level should have been on that day. So throughout this entire period then, of eight or 9,000 years, um, we can, we, I hope that you can imagine that there's a big spread of sea levels up and down here that all these artifacts would have been subjected to. I'm going backwards, but I don't know why. So wh whereas the sea level curve gives you a, a very, um, a, you know, it gives you a um, uh, temptingly accurate view of what, how things might have changed because of changing sea levels, the reality is very much different. You've got, to, you've got to spread that sea level curve out by at least five meters and probably greater. And why greater? I'll tell you in a moment. Ah, I'm gonna tell you now. Um, I'd forgotten. Right, the, the, the reason why um, the cyclones are so important is because most of these artifacts and I should have sh uh, shown you the scale. Most of the artifacts are between four centimeters and about 40 centimeters in diameter. So they're pebbles and cobbles. Right? They're not gonna be moved by normal day-to-day -day processes. They're only really gonna be moved by extreme events, such as tropical cyclones. So the occurrence of extreme events is critical in understanding whether or not these artifacts might be in situ. Okay, so to the first question, which is, are these artifacts underwater? And we'll do some basic oceanography first, right? Um, so I've put on here the um, tidal elevations from highest astronomical tide, through mean sea level to lowest astronomical tide in meters from Cape Legendre. I might just say the Cape here because for some reason my teeth don't work when I try and say Legendre, so I'm just gonna say the Cape. Um, and we can see we've got an LAT, a lowest astronomical tide of minus 2.65 meters. Remember, lowest astronomical tide is important because if the artifacts are lower than lowest astronomical tide, then they, we, yeah, they'll be permanently submerged. 
at Dampier, down here, about 35 kilometres to the south. Those are the tidal numbers, and really the only important one today is this one. Possibly that one, but this one. So the lowest astronomical tides at both of those places are about the same. This is the tidal regime proposed by B2020 based on their observations at North Gidley Island. So the highest astronomical tides, not, I've got not too many problems about those. I've got a real problem with this one and this one. Because what they propose, I'm doing it again, pressing the wrong button, sorry. What they propose is that at lowest astronomical tide, the water level here is 1.25 metres higher than here, only 10 kilometres away, and here only 25 kilometres away. That's a sea level change that's unsustainable oceanographically, um, and certainly would be quite exciting to all the bulk carriers going out, going out of here on a daily basis. Right, to that, to that site in a little bit more detail, so this is the north end, you'll get a bigger picture of this in a moment, the north end of Gidley Island in the colours, the intertidal zone in these reds and creams, and the southern part of the other island here. So this is the channel through here, and along that black line, just the middle of that black line, um, Peter Ross in his PhD plotted the elevation of all the artefacts um, documented by B2020 in this zone, taking it from the west to the east, but for about 800 metres, so from the west out to the east. I've also put on here the, the depths of the seabed, the lowest depth, so you can see we've got a basin here. Ah, oh, doing it again, sorry, I've got fat fingers. And another basin here, right? So those are all the different artefacts in that area. Right, so, and I've just, you'll, you'll see this blown up in, uh, more in a moment, all those red dots here, all the artefacts, right? So, to summarise that, B2020's asserted LAT is 1.25 metres higher than to just to the north and to the south, which is oceanographically challenging. I'm a scientist and I don't like using the word impossible, but it's pretty close to impossible. It's impossible. It requires unsustainable ocean gradients. It requires a gradient of one in 6,400, which is at least 10 and probably 100 times higher than you ever find in the ocean. So locally, the tidal scheme that B2020 uses to say, to say that its artifacts are permanently submerged is unworkable. But that's only three data points, right? So let's look a bit more broadly at the northwest shelf, the, the Pilbara shelf um, as a whole. Um, and I've drawn, so Cape Range down here, a few hundred kilometres away, Dampier and up here, right? And you know, Barrow Island and Montebello's. I put on some very simple depth contours, 20, 50, shelf edge at 100, and then going off into deeper water down the continental slope. And I'm going to, just a reminder, that's where the asserted LAT of 1.4 below is um, refers to. Now I'm going to show you a tidal wave coming in from the south west and approaching and as it approaches the crest of that wave gets distorted as it interacts with the shallow water on the shelf and now I'll just let it go and it'll refract around Barrow Island and the Montebellos and then it'll approach the Dampier and come up towards the coast. Now, all those blue lines have got numbers associated with them and those numbers are actually the lowest astronomical tide at that site. This is based on about 30 sites from all along the coast and because we've got so much oil and gas production on the shelf and on the upper continental slope there are loads of sites that have been measured for many years now so we've got brilliant records of tidal elevation changes for many, many sites out on the continental shelf. Um, right, so you can see the most obvious thing is 1.4 simply does not match with minus 2.5, right? It's, there's no way that that can be true. In fact, the nearest place on the shelf 
where you've got an LAT of minus 1.4 is about 140 kilometers away at Barrow Island. And so just to explain the shape of the, that, that curve, I guess, the, um, uh, in fact, this one will do best. As the tide comes in and hits the shelf, high water goes up and low water goes down. So our tidal ranges at the coast are large and our tidal ranges offshore are small. That's why the lowest astronomical tide is at the coast is very low at minus 3.5 and it increases offshore, okay? So, we, so that's the oceanographic data that says, don't think these things are underwater, right? The second thing you can do is you can just have a look at the seabed morphology. So here I'm just gonna show you this area of North Gidley Island and that channel. I'm just gonna blow it up a bit using the bathymetric and topographic data shown in Benjamin's paper. So you can see these are the old beach ridges on the west side of North Gidley Island. And the reds here are the intertidal and subtidal parts of that channel. The thing I would most like to draw your attention to is that just to the east is an enormous body of mobile sand, unvegetated. And just to the west is more mobile, unvegetated sand as well. So there is ample ability for the, the processes around here to mobilize sand, okay? Uh, where am I going next? Oh yeah, I'm going next to this area. So I'll sh let's show, have a look at the aerial photograph of this area. So the north end of Gidley Island, uh, a calcarinite terrace here, this, this bit, and water level on this, at this, day and time was about here and about here. There's the scale, so this is about 150 metres across. This is an aerial photograph taken with an observed low tide at Dampier about minus 1.6, 1.7. Uh, it's a fantastically gorgeous photo, I have to say. Um, some really obvious things in here like the mobile uh, sands over here and over here, no vegetation on those uh, sandy areas. There's a lack of an open connection over here and over here to the sea. There's also a lot of algal matter in this part of the basin and this part of the basin. And indications of algae in the channel are not something that you find in well flushed tidal channels. Um, the other thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have a look at a drone image of this, this particular area, again taken from the same project, um, Deep History of Sea Country project, that, um, from which um, Benjamin and co published. Um, you, so this was taken at a much lower sea level, nearly lowest astronomical tide, but not quite. Uh, and I'm going to superimpose them in a moment because I don't think they're any different in terms of the water level that you see in the channel. Um, first thing I do want to point out though, there's much less algae on the channel bed in this one. It's a different time of year, so maybe that's not critical. But there are clear indications of bed sediment transport. Obviously, the sand waves and dunes up here, but also more subtly up here, you can see there's blocks on the seabed and there's little sediment tails heading off to the top left as you look at it. So these are marks where sand has been moved through the system and accumulates behind these large rocks. So that's indicating net sediment transport on the day that that tail was formed anyway, that way. Whoops, wrong one again. So there's clear indications of bed sediment transport. Let's superimpose those two Im images now. One, there's the drone and there's the aerial photograph. And why don't you eyeball, and that will fade in and out, why don't you eyeball where you think the um, the sea level is, the water level is, and see if you can convince yourself it's any different. It should be about 0.8 metres vertically different. It's not, it's about the same. So we're dealing with a ponded system. It's ponded at the ends, controlled by the sediments on either side. So their interpretation of LAT is not an LAT, it's a ponded system. So all the artefacts are not permanently submerged. So our second question is, are these artefacts in situ? And the critical question I'll remind you was, 
is um, can movement of these coastal artifacts be ruled out? And those four questions, which are probably best addressed in order, as you'll see, can we rule out movement of the artifacts, firstly, by modern hydrodynamic processes? So let's address that one first. Um, but logically, we'd ask that question, we'd answer it and we'd say, no, we can't rule it out, or yes, we can rule it out. And then we do the next question. Um, we can rule it out or we can't rule it out. And the next one, and the next one. So we end up with this decision tree, this logical chain of questions that you require to test. The critical thing here is only if you can go, yes, I can rule it out, 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 can you possibly say that those artifacts are in situ? In every other case, you can't. It, they, may, they may have been subject to mobility by any number of different processes at any different number of times, which may affect how you interpret those things in terms of how people used those artifacts or what it says about past occupation. But you need yes, 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 and yes to be in situ. So you need, arriving at that point, you've got to be very careful with your logic to arrive there with confidence. You've got to do some very high quality investigation to answer those things in detail. And you're going to have to need to answer between four and 30 questions, depending on how many you want to deal with. And that's only a simple version, I think. But nonetheless, so let's, let's use that one on the site, first of all, on Dolphin Island, on the eastern edge of Flying Foam Passage here. This is, again, a beautiful diagram that Peter Ross put together, where we've got a digital train model of the western side of Dolphin Island. We've got various tidal levels drawn on here. That's highest astronomical tide. And then we come across the intertidal zone. At, we only go to mean low water springs. It drops off so quickly. Lowest astronomical tide is about out there as well. So we've got a very wide, I've done it again, very wide intertidal zone. It is revision those of you who weren't paying attention earlier. Um, so we've got a very wide intertidal zone, of a, as you can see, of a few hundred metres, 250 metres or more in places. A couple of things to point out. First of all, there's an Aboriginal stone quarry docu well documented down here in this zone, just south of where there's an accumulation of the yellow dots, which are lithic artefacts, rocks and stones. There are also a bunch of historic artefacts here in purple, which we won't go into today. So, these are some of the artifacts, again, to remind you of what these are, and that's a 10 centimetre scale, so these are 10 to 15 centimetres across. These were inferred by this paper to be in situ for two main reasons. First of all, the artifacts were not abraded and their edges were not rounded. Well, yeah, I can see that. They're not abraded and they're not rounded. But if they've only come a few tens of meters, we might not affect them to be rare, expect them to be a rounded or abraded. And secondly, this is a quote, we would expect any movement of artifacts to reflect the longshore direction of marine currents. I don't quite know what that means, because you can take longshore direction of marine currents to mean any number of things, I think. Because remember, if we are talking about movement of sediment, in fact, cobble and gravel sized particles in the intertidal zone, the direction that the currents were doing alongshore at the time was probably of little consequence. But nonetheless, it's, it's more complicated than I think that they thought. Um, yeah, so let's, there are three basic types of evidence here for testing this question of whether things can be moved, the movement can be ruled out by modern hydrodynamic processes. First of all, we can simply look. There's an almost complete lack of intertidal mangroves and other vegetation in this intertidal zone. The dark areas here are mangroves. The largest mangrove area here is only 100 metres long, 20 metres wide. There's a few bits up at the top, but the vast area here of the intertidal zone is unvegetated. It's unvegetated because it's mobile and things can't live there, right? Otherwise it would be covered in mangroves or seagrass. So that's, it's, it infers by itself persistent sediment mobility. 
The subtitle zone is even more clear, but we won't bother with that today. Secondly, there's a fantastic data set which some of you may or may not be familiar with. Geoscience Australia have used various means, you can ask me about it later if you like, to um, develop a database for the entire Australian coastline of where the mean sea level was located for about the last 30 years, since 1988. So we've got a, a about 28 years worth of data of where the mean sea level was along all the Australian shoreline. So we can plot that, I've just plotted a few of those on here for this, for this part of Flying Foam Passage. So that, the red line here is 2000, the one on the outside here is 1999. So you can see it's varied quite a lot even only in the last 30 years or so. And in fact at this site the location of just mean sea level has varied by more than 50 meters. Oops. So up in the northern area, greater than 50 meters, greater than 50 meters in the middle, and less than about 30 meters in the south. And remembering where the dots are here, it is inconceivable that those artifacts haven't been affected by the movement of location of the shoreline just in the last 30 years let alone the last seven or eight thousand, okay? Please argue if you want to, but it's inconceivable. The third piece of evidence which I won't go into today is that waves from the southwest coming up, flying foam passage, and from the north northeast coming down, flying foam passage, are easily, can be easily large enough, even with a 20 knot wind, like for an afternoon sea breeze, um, to refract onto that intertidal zone and mobilise sand. That's just the physics of it. So, we've started to look at the four questions. We've answered the first one and we've got a wah wah. We can, can movement of coastal artefacts be ruled out by modern hydrodynamic processes? No, it can't, right? So there's no point in going to the next three questions for this particular site. All information is consistent. The, the intertidal sediments are continually mobilized today, so the artifacts cannot be in situ. So, next the same question, and we'll go back up north to Cape Brugier, that channel, and ask the same question. So now Susie, I've... Susie, please. Please. Um, you've been talking for about 40 minutes. So okay, I'll hurry through. Okay. I've been too put off by ginger beer, clearly. Um, so here, I've plotted the uh, intertidal artifacts in red, the, and the ones that they say are supratidal in yellow. Uh, clearly, I'd argue with those, but nonetheless, that's the location of the artifacts, and they state wor the words about whether these artifacts are random or not, okay? And I don't, I'm not sure I understand most of those statements as a sedimentologist, but we can do some obvious things again. We can look at where the, sh the coastline has changed in the last 30 years. And if we plot for these points along this part of the shoreline, that's the curve we get in terms of accumulation, uh, so advance of the coast up, erosion of the coast down. So at this point, between about 1998 and 2000, there was between 8 and 10 metres of erosion along this part of the shoreline. And that's just the last 30 minutes, 30 years. So again, I think it's inconceivable that um, particularly any artifacts along here would, would have been insulated from coastal change over seven or 8,000 years. The next one, can artifact size help? I'm a sedimentologist and I like looking at trends in, in terms of grain size. We might look at a sediment transport pathway where coarser sediments are at the head of the pathway and as you go along that sediment transport pathway particles get finer and finer and finer. Well this is some good data that, that was in the paper about artifact size. Artifact sizes from 2 to 4 centimetres up to 42 centimetres. How best to use this information? With my sedimentological hat on we test the size, we look at spatial gradients and we also look at the surrounding sediments to see whether the gradients that we find in the artifacts are similar or different to the natural sediments. 
if they're different to the natural sediments than hay, we might have a, a signal about humans. If they're the same, perhaps we can't have a signal about humans. You probably wouldn't do this. Um, sorry, this is a negative part of the talk, where I'm showing you what they plotted to justify a thesis of the absence of the relationship between depth and artifact size. They plotted artifact size in centimetres against depth, they mean elevation, from naught metres down, right? And they put a line through it and say there's no relationship between it. I don't think that's very scientific, particularly when you're in an environment with a five metre tidal range and there's no hypothesis. They say there that this plot disproves a hypothesis of differential water transport. I'm not sure what that means. Um, but they say that the pattern is therefore primary and represents human use. From what I've already told you, there are some obvious problems with this. Realistic physical processes haven't been considered. They haven't considered the tidal range. They haven't considered that these are coarse particles and therefore they're affected by episodic events. Any implicit hypothesis that's in this has ignored, I think, the overwhelming likelihood that what they found is a lag deposit. So a lag deposit is a deposit of coarse material left on a surface where all the fine material is, has been swept away and you're just left with the coarse stuff. They didn't test that. They didn't take into account that there's been 7,000 years worth of processes or more and they, the last one, and I won't go into it today, I'm out of time, they don't actually have an age for the artifacts at all. The artifacts could be 200 years old, 10,000 years old, 40,000 years old, we don't know. And so I don't, that's a big, it's a big problem. So their hypothesis is invalid and their conclusion has to be invalid. So getting to the end now, for their interpretation of these artifacts to be correct, Underwater and in situ requires five things. I might let you read the first four, audience participation section. And the fifth one, the fifth one comes back to the need for those artifacts to be permanently submerged. If they've been permanent, you've got artifacts in the marine environment for 7,000 years or more, you'd expect some marine growth on them that dated more than a couple of hundred years, right? All the dates that they got on their artifacts were modern ages. So somehow there needs to be a mechanism where these things were manufactured, discarded, inundated by the sea 7,000 years ago left on a bed, immobile for 7,000 years, undisturbed by humans throughout, and somehow didn't record any marine growth during that entire period. I can't see it, personally. The other thing about the paper is, none of these five things were actually tested. But all of them need to be true. But there's no evidence that they're true. So, coming to the end now, I think just using these basic sedimentary principles, we can do things better. We should be testing rigorously for whether things are in situ using these sorts of ideas. We should be asking the key questions about do we understand the oceanography and do we understand the sediment transport processes. And of course we must consider everything over many millennia. We need to investigate logically test things, um, I think most of all consider the artifacts as sedimentary particles, which of course they are. They're big ones and they're not natural, but that's all they are. And we need to date things well. So we need to date the context and the artifacts. So we need to date sediments around the artifacts and below them and the artifacts themselves. So if you're a sedimentologist and you're maybe, I'm looking around at some of you will be young, some of you maybe will be a bit retired, I reckon there's an opportunity for you to team up with some archaeologists and get involved because there's clearly some sedimentological thinking that I think can improve the nascent and, and rapidly growing coastal and marine archaeological, archaeological research. 
Um, the other thing is, of course, just a, a mental one. If, if you are an archaeologist and you have found some artifacts and you've run through this and they're not in situ, don't be distressed about it. It's probably the most likely thing about your artifacts. Um, and there's still lots that they can reveal about, about things. So that's my, my, the title again, framed as a question. Can we be confident that the artifact scatters in the Dampier Archipelago are in situ and permanently submerged? And I think sadly the answer is no, we can't. Um, Northwest Australia must certainly wait for the first uh, in situ, sorry, underwater cultural heritage site. Um, that's me done, thank you.